a provincial town in northern China. In the streets, life is teeming. But hovering over this community, there's a menace. Many smaller towns already lie deserted, surrendered in a bitter struggle for land and livelihood. Because Asia's deserts are on the move. The heart of the Asian continent is desert, a vast arid zone far from any ocean, cut off from monsoon rains by a mighty barrier, the Himalayas. The dry lands of China alone are the size of Western Europe, and China's deserts are not just growing, they're leaping forward. <laughs> The sandstorms darken the sky. It's frightening. The storm even shatters car windows. No way you can drive. You can't steer. It's very dangerous. The storm carries away the soil. It rips off the plastic sheeting. The sand will get higher and higher until the ancient city is buried. Once the plant cover is destroyed and the wind can attack the naked surface, vast landscapes begin to move, tens of thousands of square kilometers. A flowing, creeping, flying landscape. How can it be stopped? One hope is trees. To defend their civilization against spreading deserts, millions of Chinese are planting trees. Lots of young, strong people are doing this work. We make sure that thieves won't steal our timber. We've always depended on trees. The front line is not always so clear. Often the desert sneaks up invisibly. The ancient forests die. Inner Mongolia's Ordos Plateau, 1,500 kilometers east of Beijing, the main theater in the increasingly dramatic struggle between desert and civilization. This woman is one of the many whose homes have been overrun by the war zone. I live over there. And I come here seven or eight times a day to fetch water. Until recently, she had her own well next to her house. Now the only source of water is a neighbor's well, deeper than hers. The water table here has been sinking. More than 10 meters in the last 20 years. Life is very tough out here. It's really too harsh, living on the edge of the desert. Not only is the water level sinking, the water itself is getting salty and unhealthy. The water that filled the region's natural underground reservoirs used to come from distant mountain ranges. But the river that brought nourishment to these ancient poplar trees has been drying up. Compared to the lifestyle in the East Coast boom towns, this is a life of abject poverty. Traditionally, the people on the edge of the Gobi Desert are herdsmen. Even today, the only source of income for many rural people is the wool of Kashmir goats. 
the herds depend on sufficient pasture and water. Recognizing that great numbers of people are affected by the failing water supply, the government tries a technical solution. We're building a canal, the Hei Hei Canal. The livelihoods of tens of thousands of people depend on this canal, here in Ejinaki, in western Inner Mongolia. It's a huge project, and the stakes are high. But there are doubts, even among the builders. Too much water is being taken from the upper reaches of the river. Too little is reaching us here, so the trees are dying. In the 90s, there was a report about this problem, and the government decided to build the canal. It's all about balanced water distribution and saving the environment. The causes of climate change are global, but they are also made in China. Human action is the main cause, wasting natural resources. That's what I think. If this project is successful, if there's enough water for the canal to make any difference, it'll be possible to irrigate agricultural areas here again. But getting sufficient water is only one stage of the struggle against the desert. The water is needed to plant and raise new trees. This is why thousands of nurseries are now in operation all across northern China. The vision is that one day woodlands like these will return and the desert will be pushed back. These are the last remains of Inner Mongolia's ancient poplar forests, the last giants still standing. When their deep roots can no longer reach the groundwater, the desert quickly gains the upper hand. And when the trees go, humans will soon follow. 4,000 villages have been abandoned because of the desert's advance across northern and western China. In Inner Mongolia, on the edge of the Gobi Desert, Hundreds of thousands of people have been forced to leave their homes by the worsening climate and by government policies. Great numbers of Inner Mongolia's rural population have already been moved from the countryside to urban centers. Mr. Li, a journalist, grew up in the countryside, the son of nomads, but he now lives in the city of Bayan. Many people have migrated to the cities. They had no choice. Most of them now work in the catering and restaurant business, which is expanding fast. As a result, they've improved their way of life. They get a certain amount of financial support, and their years as peasants count towards their pensions. Li has seen Bayan grow dramatically. Over there is the historic center of Bayan. It's about 200 years old. 20 years ago, about 20 to 30,000 people lived there. It used to be beautiful, very green, with trees, little rivers and water reservoirs. The new part of the city has been steadily growing since the 1980s. The population has gone up threefold to 70,000. A few hundred kilometers east in Shangxi province, is the bustling city of Yulin. Like Bayan, Yulin is right on the edge of the Gobi Desert. Twice in its history, Yulin has been completely swallowed by the desert and rebuilt in new locations. The old locations have disappeared, so far without a trace. 
Around Yulin, more than 60% of once green, fertile and wooded countryside has slowly turned into desert. Not because of drought, but because of wasteful land use. If this can't be reversed, today's Yulin could end up like its predecessors. It's huddled against the oldest part of China's Great Wall, which forms a dividing line between the Mao Wusu Desert and the Yellow Plateau, and then runs west. This was the line of defense against ancient Mongolia. Over time, both the Gobi and the Taklamakan deserts have overwhelmed many once thriving cities. Karakoto, the black city in Inner Mongolia, is one, hauntingly beautiful, but inhabited only by ghosts. Huge dunes are creeping up the 10-meter ramparts, overrunning them in places, reminiscent of the massive attack by the conquering Ming armies that slaughtered the citadel's Mongol defenders in 1372. When the Russian explorer Koslov rediscovered the Black City, the dunes had not yet breached the walls. In the tower, Koslov found a great treasure and reburied part of it in the desert nearby. With the shifting sands, no one knows where. This man, the guide to the site, has seen the Black City's environment change, and he's worried for the future of this national monument. I think the reason why the Black City is being buried is the human impact on the land. For 800 years, shifting sands were not a problem, but now they are. The population pressure on the land is simply too much. It's the same with the Black River near the Black City. It always had water. Only in recent years, as water has been used excessively for irrigation and industry, the river has run dry. When the Ming armies took this stronghold, they used the desert as their ally. They diverted the Black River, the city's sole water supply. Then they simply waited, letting thirst fight their battle. When resistance broke down, all the inhabitants were slaughtered. Until this day, a million scattered pottery shards tell of these cruel events. Most of the ceramic pieces in the terracotta we find here date from the Yuyuan dynasty, and they're scattered both within the city walls and outside. They're seven to eight hundred years old, and they're getting harder to find. The Black City was the center of the Yuyuan culture. It's one of China's preeminent historic sites. Some world famous relics have been discovered here real treasures. Not far from here are the highest sand dunes in the world. If nothing is done, Karakoto may soon completely disappear under the dunes of the Gobi. Just outside the half-buried ramparts of Karakoto is a small green area. The type of bush that's raised here once made up the natural plant cover of the desert edge, saxul. Day after day, the local inhabitants plant saxul bushes on the windward side of the black city. Resources for this project are scarce. The little plants need care, and they take a long time to grow to their full height of four meters. It's a race against time, and time is not on their side. <laughs> Once we have lots of bushes and trees here, we'll have a natural wall against the shifting sands, and the black city will be protected. Like echoes of Mongolia's long-lost cultures, these prayer flags out in the desert symbolize the one great force that has always shaped this land, the wind. New flags are added every New Year's Day because in the stiff breeze, the fabric quickly disintegrates. 
Not even rocks can withstand the wind forever. Everything in this landscape is subject to its relentless force. The entscheidende factor is the wind geschwindigkeit. The decisive factor is the wind speed. The stronger the wind, the more material can be blown from the surface. There are threshold values. For instance, a wind speed of four to eight meters per second will shift sand of medium grain size. Above that speed, enormous masses of sand can start moving. The exposed roots of dead trees show where the land surface was just two decades ago. More than two meters of soil have been blown away. When the sand arrives here, we don't stand a chance. The sand level can rise by 10 to 20 meters a year. Over thousands of years, a continually shifting landscape has created a corresponding way of life. Traditionally, the people of Mongolia have been wanderers. We're nomads in the desert. We get our water from deep wells, 10 to 20 meters deep. But in some places, even the deepest wells are running dry. We keep moving on to where some grass is left. We shift our tents several times a year. In the past five or six years, the wind has become stronger and it carries more sand. All we can do is raise livestock. How could we live in a city? We couldn't find a job in the city. As the desert is becoming more aggressive, tens of thousands of ethnic Mongolians and Ugyurs are giving up herding and farming and moving to the city. For these ecological migrants, it's not easy to give up their traditional way of life. But for those few who are holding out in the desert, conditions are getting tough. On a single day, I have lost some 30 animals. The sandstorms are killers. In spring, sandstorms are especially frequent and violent. Sheep, Kashmir goats and Bactrian camels have always greatly outnumbered people in Inner Mongolia. Ten years ago, there were 250,000 camels here. Now only 50,000 are left, and even that may be too much. The causes for the destruction of the plant cover are on the one hand overgrazing and on the other wind erosion. Feeding and trampling the earth can increase the natural rate of wind erosion up to 40 times. The action of hooves loosens up sand and dust particles on the surface. We've been able to simulate this effect in a wind tunnel. And we found that when a herd passes over a surface, 20 times more dust and sand will be picked up by the wind. Lee, the journalist, is in his early 30s, and yet he's already witnessed a radical change in the places of his childhood. When I was a boy, the grass would be that high. There were lots of tiny wild animals. Meanwhile, the grassland has vanished, and the animals too have become rare. Until the early 20th century, much of Mongolia was a prairie with oceans of swaying grass and Saxul bushland. In the days of Genghis Khan, the rye grass was so high that an army of thousands of horsemen could hide here. Today, only tiny patches remain. In a nomadic society, livestock means wealth. This leads to a situation where the limited pastures are overexploited. The result is that the plant cover is irreparably damaged. And the surface soil is exposed to wind erosion.
When this happens on a large scale, the people are forced to leave the land, and that's a very worrying situation. But overgrazing is just one cause of desertification. When the natural plant cover is broken up by the plough, a situation is created where enormous amounts of dust and sand can be blown out. This is what happened in the 1930s in the American Midwest, where vast landscapes were severely damaged, creating the notorious Dust Bowl. In his novel, The Grapes of Wrath, American author John Steinbeck dramatically described the mass migration of bankrupt farmers. It was an environmental, economic and social disaster, triggered by bad land use in a windy climate. There are striking parallels between the American Dust Bowl and what happened in Inner Mongolia after it was annexed by Mao in 1947. Mao thought Mongolia's vast green plains could feed China's exploding population. He forced millions of Chinese farmers to move here. But it didn't work. Our corn seedlings were hit by sandstorms that killed many of them. Otherwise, we would have had a better harvest and the cobs would be bigger. We had to reseed some of our fields, so half of the plants and cobs are smaller than the rest. Even on a day the locals would describe as windless and calm, the breeze is enough for an ancient way of separating the grain from the chaff. The grain in this case is sunflower seeds, a traditional Chinese crop, but not ideally suited to the windy, sandy environment of Mongolia. Today there are 20 million Chinese in Inner Mongolia. Only three and a half million ethnic Mongolians are left. Mao's policy not only increased the population pressure on the land, it also created a new problem. Nomads were able to react more flexibly to changes in the environment, whereas sedentary farmers have to stay put when the desert shrinks or expands. When the worst sandstorm came, we were over there. There was so much sand in the wind that we couldn't see our hands in front of our faces. The wind and the sand ripped out the young plants till there was nothing left at all. All the plants were dead. This spring, the sandstorms even pulled up big trees. All across northern China, enormous efforts have been made to plant rows of trees called shelter belts to protect the crops against sandstorms and the soil against wind erosion. Inner Mongolia seems to be lagging behind, and for farmers like this one, the required investment is simply beyond reach. The, the open area here is very large. You'd need a lot more trees than we already have. Our community is poor, and unfortunately, we don't get any state subsidies. Countless truckloads of fine soil are blown away every year. But the phenomenon itself isn't new, and it even has a positive side. A thousand kilometers to the east, massive deposits of wind-blown dust have created one of China's most fertile landscapes. But the long march of the Gobi Desert doesn't end here. Gullies like this are washed out by rainfall. It can happen very slowly or very fast. Even several meters in the course of a single heavy rainstorm. These patterns of sand and dust were created by a rainstorm. 
Landscapes are constantly being changed by such mass flows. The Huanghou or Yellow River in Ningxia, northern China. Its tributaries wash out deep canyons and wide valleys from the layers of wind-blown dust accumulated over millions of years in the Yellow Plateau. The fields here are so productive that farmers have always tolerated the regular floods in the region. The load of silt and sand carried by the Huanghou River system, even when water levels are low, has never been calculated. But it must be enormous. And equally enormous is the journey this desert dust has taken by air and is now taking by water from the Yellow Plateau along the Yellow River down to the Yellow Sea, where it has created a vast delta. Back in the Gobi Desert, the Silk Road. For centuries, this was the only link between the Occident and the Orient. 2,000 years old, 7,000 kilometers long. Between the Gobi Desert and the Taklamakan is the ancient gateway to the Far East, the Duanhuang Oasis, crossroads of caravan routes. Two thousand three hundred years ago, the first caravan of several hundred camels must have passed the military outposts near Dunhuang. Thousands of people, troops, and traders were once crowded within these walls. The landscape must have been green. Today, all that remains is the salt crust of a dried out lake. Even now, traveling the Silk Road is a journey full of risks and dangers, a true adventure. The only human presence, 200 kilometers from the nearest town, is this group of yurts, a major Silk Road truck stop. This is a difficult run. You have to be extremely careful not to lose the road and get stuck in the deep sand. Until two years ago, it was just a sand track. It got damaged in every sandstorm, and there were lots of accidents. It was quite easy to lose your bearings. It used to take us three to four days to cross this part of the Gobi. Now it's hardly a day. <laughs> Services are basic. Water, yes. Fuel, no. Tea, yes. Food, sometimes. Mechanical services? Depending on your definition of mechanical services. Even the new road is tricky. Half the time you don't see it because of drifting sand. And in drifting sand you can't steer. If you lose control and there are rocks along the road, you crash. Our repair shop is the only one for two to three hundred kilometers around. When there's a breakdown in the desert, we go and fetch the vehicle and repair it here. A mechanic's job out here is more like being in the Coast Guard or the Mountain Rescue Service. Oh, we get a lot of sandstorms in this area. One every eight to ten days. The family used to raise camels and goats. They were nomads, until they decided that the automobile business was more profitable. <laughs> One day, there'll also be a repair shed to keep the sand from flying into transmission boxes and differentials. 
The truckers sometimes have to wait two or three days until we can pick them up. The sandstorms can be too strong. We simply can't get there in the storm. Sandstorms are worse when there's no rain. And we haven't any rain for 10 years. The Gobi may have little rain, but the Himalayas have lots of snow and ice. From space, it's easy to see where the water that does exist in the desert comes from. Melt water flows a long way. The lifeline of the Dunhuang oasis is the Shulihere River, which gets its water from the glaciers of the Himalayas from hundreds of kilometers away. But this blessing may not last. If the glaciers keep melting at the present rapid rate, we can anticipate that Dunhuang's water supply will gradually dry up. Many smaller settlements in the region have already been abandoned because they were cut off from this water supply. Again and again over thousands of years, the desert has turned many once flourishing places into cemeteries of civilization. This is the graveyard of Dunhuang. Since the dead don't need water and dry land is free, the necropolis sprawls out into the desert. It's much bigger than the city of the living where people are crowded around the water. At Dunhuang's famous night market, desert tourists from all over China pour over the stands for Silk Road souvenirs. Root carving is a traditional Chinese craft. And right now, this artist is finding it hard to keep up with the demand. In the old days, Dunhuang was an exemplary city. The present government wants to bring back the old glory and has decided to renovate the old streets. Instead of simple hovels built of clay, now we have modern buildings and wide streets. Dunhuang used to be a farming community. Now it's a tourist center. This ancient crossroads linked India and Tibet to Mongolia and Russia, and the Pacific coast to the Mediterranean Sea. Three of the world's major religions spread along the Silk Road. For the greater part of two millennia, Dunhuang has been a truly multicultural city. Heavily laden caravans bore enormous riches of silk, spices and gold, as well as ideas, across the entire Eurasian continent. This was the last stop before the hardest part of the passage, the Taklamakan. Dawn in the dunes brings back the old days of the Silk Road. But once the rising sun has crossed the horizon, modern China is back in the Gobi. For most of these tourists from China's newly rich east coast and from South Korea, the desert is a mere fairground. Another item to tick off on the list of chic holiday destinations. Another story to tell back at the office. Even if some of them know that this is where the sandstorms come from that keep hitting Seoul and Beijing, 
Probably none are aware that the Gobi is growing, and why it's growing, and how fast. What is obvious is the stunning growth of desert tourism, bringing more revenue to Dunhuang and to China's central government than the Silk Road ever did when it was booming. While the desert, paradoxically, is bringing new wealth to some, others are still caught in the struggle against its relentless advance. Peasants have bent their backs picking cotton for more than a millennium in China, and they're still doing so on the fringes of Dunhuang. <laughs> this was once an ideal place for many other crops, like grapes and melons. Dunhuang was famous for its orchards, too. But in recent years, the range has become limited. We used to grow melons in these fields. But because there was more and more sand, they would no longer grow. That's why we started with cotton, because the desert is closing in on Dunhuang. All the fields are surrounded by saxul bushes and rows of trees. But the colossal dunes behind make the poplar rows look like a very thin line of defense indeed. To halt a massive invasion of the desert, a master plan is needed. A lush green park back in Beijing surrounds the headquarters of China's campaign against the advancing deserts. This man is the campaign's mastermind. Professor Sun, China's leading forestry expert, has spent his entire life battling desertification. From the roof of the building housing the Beijing Forest University, he can overlook the greenest part of the sprawling capital. The state has taken many countermeasures against desertification. First and foremost, the Great Green Wall project, aimed at creating a protective belt of woodland across 14 provinces in northern China. So far, the biggest success of this campaign has been the revitalization of woodlands in China's northeast, north and northwest. That's why we call it the Three North Project. Within two decades, the proportion of wooded areas in these regions has grown from 5 to 11 percent. Yet Professor San adds that the frequency of sandstorms hitting Beijing has increased 15-fold since the 1950s. Although billions of trees have already been planted, the effect of these single rows is local at best. Planting rows of trees or hedges is an effective way of lowering wind speeds below the critical threshold of erosion and of limiting the damage. But generally, in order to slow down or stop wind erosion, we need to increase the plant cover across the entire surface. This is the only way to protect soils from being blown away. 1,000 kilometers west of Beijing, a few hours drive southwest of the desert city of Yulin, local farmers have been working to achieve exactly that. Driving through this green and pleasant land, there's little to suggest that this country lane actually leads through a dune landscape. Only a closer look reveals the typical dune shapes and the sandy soil. Incredibly, 20 years ago, all this was barren sand without a blade of grass. Today, only when a storm rips open a fresh wound in the plant cover, and it has to be patched up, can you appreciate the effort an entire generation has invested in the regreening of this area? <laughs> On a windless day, a special desert grass is sown across the open patch. 
Years of research and experience have resulted in a list of ideal pioneer plants and in special planting techniques. Today in China, there's probably more expert knowledge about combating deserts than anywhere else in the world. The regreening is done in several stages, and all the stages must be completed on the same windless day. If the wind comes up, it's back to square one. But between stages one and two, there's time for a little lunch break. <laughs> the foreman of the farm is old enough to remember the history of this landscape. He knew it before it was a desert. He saw how it became a desert. And he's been instrumental in pushing the desert back again. Originally, many years ago, this was natural grassland and woodland. But overgrazing, logging and ploughing destroyed the plant cover, and it became a desert. The sands buried wheat fields and many houses. When the sand comes, people have to go. First, they make a grid in the sand, with two meter by two meter squares. Then, they stabilize the surface with straw, so the sand doesn't blow away. The straw also keeps the ground moist, and eventually fertilizes it. Next, they plant the first trees. They're usually willows, acacias, Chinese spruce, and a type of cypress. These are specialists that will take root in the sand. They're also resistant to drought and cold. And what's especially important is that rabbits and goats don't like eating them. Alfalfa is sown as a nurturing crop to improve soil fertility. Other plants profit from the alfalfa's ability to convert nitrogen from the air into a natural fertilizer. When alfalfa blossoms, the wind smells of honey. It attracts millions of insects, whose presence encourages the growth of new plants. Gradually, with wild plants and wild animals returning, a complex new ecosystem begins to take hold. Thousands of nurseries right across northern China are raising millions of trees. Each Chinese citizen at one or several points in his life is expected to plant trees as part of the national effort to save the environment. Building the Great Green Wall against the desert is a very Chinese way of doing things. Really large scale and involving everyone, even several generations. This huge project started in 1978 and is supported by many other countries. The Chinese regard this as the greatest project in the history of mankind, and they could be right. Millions of hectares have already been replanted. It's a necessity, considering the extreme climatic conditions. Although these efforts are most urgently needed in central China, the desert is even creeping up on the capital. Only an hour's drive from the city, a small village has helped secure Beijing's water supply by reforesting an entire mountain range. What's so interesting about this is the fact that in China, unlike in Europe, 
The profession of forester doesn't exist. They carry out an enormous amount of reforestation without the professional staff you would expect. <coughs> Many of the villagers proudly bear the title of new forest farmer and work part-time for the Great Green Wall project. They get expert instructions from the village's town hall. Since they brought back the forest, their wells are again filled with good drinking water. And so are Beijing's reservoirs. The key to this success is explained by the local government's forestry expert. We tried a new system here, very different from the traditional system. Normally, the government gives a village a certain amount of money or materials, and the farmers plant trees on public land. Here, the forestry experts and the farmers discuss together what trees to plant and where to plant them. The local people are involved in these decisions, and they plant the trees on their own land. Since I came to live here, I've planted all kinds of trees, including chestnut and walnut. Since last year, we're even getting paid for this work. A few years ago, we had a team of forest guards. I was one of them. One of our tasks is guarding the trees so that no one cuts and steals them. Today, the new forest farmers are cutting the grass from under young trees, so they'll grow better and are not damaged by forest fires. If it weren't for the green barrier that now surrounds this place, even the highest garden wall couldn't stop the onslaught of the desert and its shifting sands. The builder of this portion of the Great Green Wall is a botanist specialized in desert plants. He seems quite pleased with the result of his work, and justly so. We've been monitoring the progress of the Great Green Wall with GPS and satellite data. Forty years ago, this was a landscape of sand, but look at it now. We can see lots of green trees all around, and it's nice and cool. A mix of grasses, broadleaf and conifer trees has stabilized the sand, and the place is full of lovely smells. We've got 167 different types of trees and bushes here now, and lots of flowering plants. This is one of many local battles that have been won. But the war against the desert is far from over. Again and again, the desert jumps even huge barriers. Although past human errors are being corrected and man-made wasteland is being reclaimed at enormous cost, climate change remains the big unknown. There's a steady, dramatic rise in the frequency of extreme storms. The creation of deserts and the way they spread depends on the behavior of the climate on the one hand and on the other, on the behavior of man. Currently, the impact of humans is leading to desertification. A still growing population of 1.3 billion, a fast forward economy, a huge desert and an increasingly freakish global climate make it impossible to predict who will eventually hold sway over the heart of Asia. The world's oldest civilization or the desert?